Houston is the beating heart of a sprawling industrial region with a busy port and one of the largest concentrations of petrochemical facilities in the world. That's made a lot of people very rich. And it's polluted our bayous and bays, contaminated our soil, fouled our air with smog and toxic chemicals. It's made a lot of people very sick. One Houston community of color after another has been besieged in the same way by the same things. The dumps in up in Sunnyside, not Bel Air. The refineries ring around Manchester and Galena Park, not Westview. The concrete batch plants pile up in Acres Homes. The freeways infringe on near north side and Independence Heights. The impacts, they accumulate. In 1979, Dr. Robert Bullard, the sociologist at Texas Southern, started making the connections. Using color-coded maps, Bullard and his team charted waste disposal in the city. While only a quarter of Houston's population was black, all five of the city's landfills were located in black neighborhoods along with six of the eight city-owned incinerators. This research was key in identifying what today we've come to know as environmental racism. These communities were intentionally exposed. It just uh, made me realize how important I was, because I was shown nothing but love when I was growing up as a child, when it came to the village of the Fifth Ward area. And that's what we was, we was a village, you know, that uh, we did not have to worry about children. Children, you know, played and uh, they ran from neighbor home to they own home, they play in the neighbor yard, and they play in their own yard, and you could know that somebody was looking after them. As time went on by, we started seeing the uh, freeways built, and that was really a problem because we couldn't go from one side to the other side. Suddenly, the air was not the quality that we had before they built these freeways. If they did inquire with the community that they was building them, the community must not, never really knew. In the 1930s, her neighborhood was labeled by the federal government as hazardous. Maps showed banks where to invest and also where not to. Redlining, it was called. Intentionally depressed land values made it cheap for polluters. And the residents' health and wealth suffered. I was between 13 and 14 years old when I first started calling because the, the fumes were just so awful. They were sickening and, and it penetrated the house. And <clears throat> you couldn't escape it. It was so bad, it made me nauseated. Literally, it was just this god-awful smell. So I had to do something. All you could see was the black smoke and stuff in the air that used to, it used to choke us. It was kind of like a gas, and we didn't know what it was, but our mom used to make us come in the house when, you know, when it got real tough out there. In April of 2004, Alice's father, Joe G. Torres, was diagnosed with cancer. By the time he was diagnosed, it was terminal cancer. It was all in his bones. It was in his spine. It was in his skull. 
I mean, it was it was horrible. <clears throat> By the time I discovered it, because I had to find it, I had stage four lymphoma. Well, my mom passed the cancer. So I feel like that's a residual from it. My aunt, she stayed down there on Liberty Road and she passed also of cancer. Were we exposed to chemicals? Absolutely. You know, obviously that affected us in some way. We were exposed because we were deemed expendable because it was black and brown people. That is, to me, it's not even a question. That's why. Houston's historic Third Ward is home to a vibrant visual and performing arts scene and Emancipation Park, a park founded by once enslaved persons which hosted the first Juneteenth celebration. George Floyd also grew up in this community. And the same systemic racism identified in the Fifth Ward and Kashmir Gardens communities is manifested here along with segregation, Jim Crow, racial terror, freeway development, underinvestment, over-policing, and now gentrification. The most central topic to all of this has been decision-making. There's no sort of community when you have all these big money organizations who are coming into a place and acting as if the people who are presently there don't exist. But that's a problem all over the city. People treat it as though they don't exist, as though their lives don't matter. I guess when a person, you know, fight to be human, that takes a lot out of view. And sometimes you just say, I'm just gonna give up. I'm mind my own business. I don't have anything that I need to do with my neighbor or my community. And I just shut the door and leave the outside out there and I'm inside with my family. Natural disasters like 2017's Hurricane Harvey, which resulted in citywide flooding, and pandemics like that of COVID-19, which has devastated globally, only reveal exactly what these communities have been trying to tell us for years. There is no equal about any of this. And I've been here for about 15 years on this property. Uh, but my parents own the property. It's been like 50 years that we own. It's not in great shape, but I'm going to salvage it and keep it. The property damage, the mold, um, the repairs that needed to be done, um, finances that weren't there. So we had to reach out to uh, sources and in the process of reaching, it, reaching out, uh, I just want to found out there was a lot more other people in my situation that were doing the same, trying to get help. One day somebody said, let's get together and talk about it. So we, we met at the church, invited as many people that wanted to come and people were talking about how they were feeling and how, what condition they were in, and we started from there. While they were working on the house that we started talking, and they realized, we, were, we all realized that I still wanted to fight. <laughs> I still wanted to change things. I still, I, I still yearn for a better world, a more equitable world. And our house still, I know it looks like it's done, but our house still isn't finished. I'm still trying to get uh, the city of Houston to finish our house. We still have s some work to do.
I wanted my mom to see her house finished. I wanted her to see it nice again. Unfortunately, she didn't. She didn't get to see that. I think this house represents a culmination of my my mother and father's hard work. And um, I think I owe it to them and um, to finish the house and to be grateful that they left they left this. What's been so beautiful is to see the grace of, of many of the older organizers because they have no interest in breaking things because they know to transform the relationship between residents and big developers and the city is not necessarily dependent on breaking things. Does that make sense? And I think that's been a, such a, te that's a big lesson to me. And that's what I really want everybody to understand. This is something that you just don't be in tomorrow and you quit the next day. This is the struggle of a lifetime. So if you want any change, you are your own change agent. And when you look in that mirror and you ask yourself, have I done enough? And the answer is always no, because there's always something else to be done. So that made me feel good when I can look back. And there I see my children. Now I can look back even further and there are my grandchildren really looking at and listening and, and wants to do the same thing as grandma and mama and, and daddy is doing. And if you don't think voting matters, you know, if you, you don't see things changing, well then you be the change. You make, you make it matter, you know. Make them answer to you. Make a call. You know, say, hey, I voted for you. Why aren't you doing this for me like you promised? Hold people accountable.